We have looked at uh, looking at our uh, overview here, uh, Ezekiel 1 to 24 is that portion where we have the sins announced and the resulting judgment upon Judah. And that begins, of course, with the commission of Ezekiel in chapters 1 to 3. Uh, we then begin uh, the actual uh, series from 4 to 24, which is a series of oral messages and symbolic acts kind of interchange. You have usually a symbolic acts, then there's an oral message that we'll talk about and give further explanation. Then you have a vision or symbolic act, and then you'll have oral messages that will develop and expand. So there's a very definite, clear pattern and structure that Ezekiel's working with in that sense. And these are designed in this whole portion from 4 to 24 to warn the people of the coming judgment uh, and the reasons for it. And it will be, uh, there'll be, this will be done over and over again. There's, there is repetition, but it's done in different ways. As I say, Ezekiel, God through Ezekiel is seeking to communicate the fact, hey guys, wake up. It's here, it's coming. Oh, you didn't get that? That's, okay, let's try it again. Guys, wake up. <laughs> It's coming. Here's why. You say why? Here's why. Don't get it. Okay, let's try it again. You know, He's constantly, and he's using uh, symbolic acts, drama, and so forth, as well as the messages that tend to, the oral messages. So he'll start, for instance, uh, in chapter 4. You have the drama of the siege uh, of Jerusalem and the dispersion that will occur after. And he acts all this out for them. Now remember, he's talking to people who have already been deported. Okay? They were, they were there. So they understand the deportation. But it's amazing how, how dense they are. How hard-headed. Because he'll act out what they have already gone through. And they'll say, what's that? You know? So he's using the picture of the siege of Jerusalem. It's going to be siege. Jerusalem's going to fall. See, they didn't think Jerusalem would fall. I mean, that's, that's their great hope is Jerusalem and the temple. I mean, this is, the, the, this is their pride and joy, their precious treasure. And it's still there. We still have hope. No, it's going to fall. There's going to be a siege and the people are going to be, be dispersed in that situation. And then we will see the judgment messages that follow in chapter 6 and 7 where he will simply say the captivity will come. It cannot be avoided. No human efforts are going to stop it. Because they kept thinking, no, no, we're not, it isn't going to happen. We're going to get out of this thing. No, no, it is going to happen. And the, the pagan idolatry and so forth will be destroyed. God's going to get rid of all that stuff. And there's nothing you can do to stop this in the process. Then we're going to see that... Uh, we have in chapters 8 to 11, we'll have a vision where Ezekiel is actually going to be taken in a vision transported to Jerusalem. Uh, you read the text carefully. We'll talk about it when we get there. Uh, when he gets there, he, this is done in a vision. This is not done, he didn't take a land trip. This is done in the vision, okay, where he is transported to Jerusalem and there is the shown to him all of the wickedness and the idolatry and the pagan worship that's going on by the leaders of Judah in Jerusalem. And then there will be the reappearance of the glory of God, which is dwelling, you know, the glory of God would come and dwell in the, in, in the Holy of Holies. And the glory of God will be there. And because of the idolatry and paganness of them, the glory of God will depart from the temple to the Mount of Olives and then it's gone. Because the glory of God cannot be present with the idolatry of the people as God brings his judgment. So the glory is departing and God will judge that point. The glory of God is very important because in chapter 43 of Judah, way down at the end, 
the glory of God will return in the future kingdom when they are cleansed as a people and restored to the land. But not while the judgment's taking place. He, it, it's truly Ichabod, if you know about him. And uh, that, that name, the glory has departed, just like it did at the time in the judges, because of the wickedness and idolatry of the people. That's one of those themes that's very beautifully demonstrated here. Uh, so we see that in chapters uh, 8 through 11. And then in chapters 12 to 19, we have uh, objections on the part of the uh, recipients and questions and uh, rationalizations as to why this shouldn't happen. And uh, Ezekiel will deal with those and answer each of those uh, as he goes along. Yes. I have a question on um, the departure of God's glory from the temple. Can you explain uh, why Jesus still referred to uh, the temple when he arrived as, as you know, his father's house? all nations, yet the, the, clearly God was no longer in the temple. Did God consider that still, even though his glory had departed? Departed still his resting place? Well, the temple is a very interesting uh, issue just throughout the scripture and uh, has created a lot of debate as well. Uh, the temple in the Old Testament, the literal temple, of course, but the temple is a visual representation to the people because they can see it there's a temple of where God visually and again I'm coming back to the way they, they think visually God visually dwelt among his people now we know that God is in the scripture tell he's not limited to a building but it was a picture for them it was because they thought visually they could it was a visual representation of God's presence among them and that concept is true even when you come to the New Testament and it is used in an imagery way that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the place where God's Spirit dwells or the church is the temple of God. In other words, it's the same kind. It's a visual. The temple is the visual picture of where God's presence is seen. So I think when Jesus talks about the temple, it is, it is the place, it is the sanctuary where God was visually among his people. It is in that sense, it is his house. It is a house that's defiled in Jesus' time. And he will talk about the defilement of the temple. In fact, we know what he did in the temple courts. But it's still the purpose of the temple, though being misused, is still there valid. Uh, so I think we have to see it in, in light of those concepts concerning the temple. Uh, okay, now when we come to chapters 20 uh, through 23, we kind of go back, and then he goes back and summarizes at that point, and he will say at that point, here is... The unfaithfulness, let me give you the history. Let me go back and look historically. Uh, the history is that all of the nation has become corrupt. It's primarily uh, promulgated by the leadership of the people. The people have once again become, uh, they are like prostitutes in chapter 23. So there's... Now that we've gone through and I've announced all the judgments and I've pictured them for you, I've dealt with your questions about why you think there shouldn't be any judgment, now I want to tell you it's here. It's coming. And I'm going to review your history to just to vindicate, to remind you once again, this is why. Just look at your history. Okay? Look at your leadership. It's too late. In chapter 24, Jerusalem falls. So that's, that's the scope of what we're going to see from 4 to 24. And uh, we'll take uh, each one at a, at a chance, at a stop here. We're going to look first of all, uh, hopefully in our remaining time today, at chapters 4 to 7. Uh, but I hope you see that overall summary. It's, it's, it's not difficult. It's these chapters are dealing with 
the judgment and the reasons for it. Acts, symbolic acts, oral messages, visions, oral messages, and then the reasons why they think it shouldn't happen, then a summary of why their history demonstrates that it will, and it does. Boom. And there it is. Question: Is there any text that shows that God's glory returned to the temple when it was rebuilt prior, uh, prior to Jesus' day? Uh, that's an interesting question. And it's interesting if you look at the book of Haggai. Uh, if you've studied the book of Haggai, you know, he talks about the, their, one of their great concerns in Haggai was that the temple that they were rebuilding, you know, at the return after the Babylonian captivity, a lot of the older people... Uh, we'd have to assume people that are <laughs> up in age, 80s or 90s, you know, if they'd been there 70 years in captivity, uh, were dismayed because it wasn't the glory of the, of the Temple of Solomon. And uh, we're told by Haggai that, uh, that this, will, this house will be glorious by the one who shall be in it. Now, we all know that Jesus was in the temple. Uh, the, actually, the Herodian temple is a we would call it day a renovation of uh, the temple of Zerubbabel. It was uh, re rebuilt, remodeled, and in a great way uh, under Herod, but was in a sense the same facility. Uh, and uh, yes, Jesus was there. Is he the glory of God? You bet he is. Uh, nothing you can do about that, but. We've got to understand the glory of God in the sense of Ezekiel's message. That, and, and again, we have to understand it in the, simple, you know, the previous question. Though the, the, uh, concerning the people of Israel, the judgment is still on. It's on today. They're still dispersed. Okay? That did not uh, in any way restrain or keep God from sending his son to die for sin, and now we're the, the instrument through which God's working is the church. I think the two go together, we, and we have to see, but there are different emphases. One here is talking about the people of Israel. When we're talking about Jesus and the temple and his glorious presence, uh, we're talking about that as it relates at the time of the beginning of the church, but does not in any way disqualify or remove the concept that as far as Israel, as a people, as a nation, when they are restored to the land and cleansed and restored, then the glory of God as relates to the people of Israel and the judgment upon Israel will, re will return and the judgment will no longer be present. I, I hope that's clear, but it may be like mud. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Um. You had shared with us that from chapters 4 to 24, uh, there's a judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, is there any mention of the prophet Jeremiah's ministry? Any references to Jeremiah in that portion of Ezekiel? Not that I'm aware of. Daniel will refer to Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. But Ezekiel is silent in Jeremiah's ministry. And it's also, Jeremiah has no mention of Ezekiel. No. Uh, I think you, the, perhaps the reason you have a mention of, uh, well, uh, Ezekiel does mention Daniel. At least I think he mentions Daniel. Some people don't. <laughs> they think it's Daniel of, uh, you know, the Canaanite religion, but um, I think that's difficult to argue. But I think those two men are in close proximity in Babylon, you know. They're not that far apart. So they could hear of what's happening among them. Uh, but Jeremiah certainly is far removed, though obviously Daniel is aware of that, and obviously information does go back and forth. Um, you know, why Jeremiah doesn't mention Ezekiel and Ezekiel doesn't mention Jeremiah, I don't know. Obviously Jeremiah is giving a, the same message to the people back in the hometown, so to speak, back in Jerusalem, that uh, Ezekiel is giving to the people in exile saying, uh, you know, the guys in Jerusalem are going to come join you. <laughs> you know, they're not going to stay there. But that, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, those are all, I was talking to someone else about another question, but those are, those are some of those many things that obviously in, in a book, the book doesn't give us everything that happened. 
And uh, those are those questions we have to ask those guys when we get there in heaven. I got a whole pile of them. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, let's sit down and talk for a while. You know, let me t tell me a little bit more. Fill in the gaps here. <laughs> what what all went on here? You guys ever talk to each other? You know, obviously they didn't have cell phones, but uh, <laughs> yeah. so there's a lot of things like that. It'd be fun to find out. Okay, chapter four in the the monodrama that goes on here in Jerusalem. Um, and now, if you you're you're going to have to visualize, okay. You're going to have to be a good Hebrew. You're going to have to think descriptively. We've got, we have Ezekiel out here who is mute. He's not speaking, but he's going to do a drama of the siege of Jerusalem. His audience is, are the elders who undoubtedly probably watched him for seven days and wondered uh, what's going to happen, what is he going to do next in this situation. And so he's told by God to get a brick. We don't know how big the brick is and all that. We need to get a brick and to inscribe on the brick uh, what, what we'd basically say, a little, an outline, a diagram of Jerusalem. You know, it'd be just like if somebody said, would you draw a picture of ancient Jerusalem? So you get your paper out and you'd draw this little thing that would look like that, you know, so to speak. And uh, he's to draw this. It's very, very clear to them. Oh, this is Jerusalem. And then he is to put up siege equipment around it. Uh, you know, I don't know whether he had toys or what he had. Because it doesn't tell us all that. But he was to set up the siege ramps and the siege engines and so forth. And then he was to take uh, one of the iron skillets that the priests used and put that up as a wall. And there's a great debate about that. Uh, some argue that uh, this is a, a wall does two things. It either keeps people out or it keeps people in. You know, that's true for any wall. Uh, you know, it used to be under communism, the wall kept people in and kept other people out. Uh, so, you know, you have different walls are for one of the two reasons. So the debate has been, did it keep, uh, was the wall set, set there to, as a typical siege wall, and a normal siege wall was put up so that people couldn't leave, you know, when they got hungry and so forth. After a while, people were trying to escape and siege walls are put up to make sure the people didn't escape from the siege, but they would be killed in the process. Uh, some will argue that this, that this uh, wall is protection for uh, Ezekiel. Uh, I personally think in the context of that this is a picture of the siege, that it makes more sense that this is doing the function of a siege wall. Uh, that the people are, the judgment's coming and they aren't going to get out of this. I mean, that's the type of message that he's going to tell them. Nobody can get out of this. This is in here. Now, obviously, there will be dispersions and so forth after the siege. Uh, to uh, In what way Ezekiel is being protected, uh, I don't know. So I, I would lean more to the fact that this is forming the normal function of a siege wall. Yes? Those commentators who uh, suggest that Ezekiel is a type of God here, He's turning his face against the city right. around the judgment. The, the, the plate symbolizes then uh, their prayers are turned back and not heard. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a pretty popular view? Uh, not a real popular one, but uh, it is a view. Yeah. As I say, again, it's uh, whether you keep something in or you keep something out, and whether you're protecting somebody or whether you're restraining somebody. I know they you try to support it by saying that uh, put it between you and the city. Right. And then turn your face against it in judgment. But, but you see, where else are you going to put a siege wall? You know, you got to put it between the, uh, the, the, so to speak, the attacker and the enemy. And, and in this sense, Ezekiel is the one that's laying siege. He's, he's, dra he's dramatizing the siege of Jerusalem, which would be inside the wall. So in a sense, he kind of represents the attacker, even if he is God. And he does turn his face against them, which is afraid, I'm against you. So he is in many ways representing the, uh, the attacker. And the siege wall was always between the attacker and the enemy because you didn't, you know, you didn't want them to get past that. And you'd get them if they did. Uh, so I say, I just, in light of the, the fact that the context is a siege, it seems to me to make more sense, though I'm not going to live or die, you know, with some dogmatism. It seems to make more sense that this is, this is just, he's, this is part of the picture, part of the picture of laying siege. 
uh, that he's dramatizing. Uh, really, whichever way you go isn't going to change anything really <laughs> dramatically uh, at that point. But it's a picture of a siege, and he's simulating that in every way. Now, uh, as he does this, he turns his face, which is in a sense of a determination, a, uh, and, and you might say like one's attacking there. And for 430 years, 390 years, first of all, he's going to lay on his left side okay, and face the north. And then after that, he's going to lay on the right side. By the way, if you know the directions, the way things are directions in ancient Israel, you face east. Left is to the north, right is to the south. In fact, yamin, right, is one of the words for south. Okay. Okay. Now, on the north, you, you're on the left side to face north, and you're on the right side and face south. Left side, he goes on to tell us, is Israel. Right side is the judgment upon Judah. And for 390 days, and he makes it very clear in the text, a day represents a year. Okay? So every day you're on represents a year of where you, Ezekiel, will bear the, uh, the you, in a sense, you're representing the bearing of the punishment for 390 days on Israel and, I mean, for 390 years, and 40 years for Judah, okay? This is all while the siege is going on. He's out here laying on different sides, okay, as this is going on. And then we read, uh, at the end of that, he says, um, they're going to tie you with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other. Well, obviously, he's not bound 24 hours a day, you know, for 430 days. Because we, we have him giving messages and we have him doing some cooking and so forth. I think the point is that he is again, remember it's a picture. He is bound so that he stays on the one side, so to speak, for the proper amount of time. And then he's on the other side for the proper amount of time. It's the general picture again that, that we're looking at uh, within the context. Then uh, he goes on to say, in verse 9, and take wheat and barley, beans, lentil, millet, and spelt, put them in a storage jar, and use them to make bread for yourself. Uh, you are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side, and weigh it out in 20 shekels of food to uh, each day, and eat it at set times. Also, uh, one sixth of a hen, or about uh, two thirds of a quart of water, and drink it at set times, and eat the food as you would a barley cake, and bake it in the sight of the people, and so forth. Now, uh, how many of you have ever eaten Ezekiel bread? Ezekiel 4-9 bread. Okay, we got some here. For the rest of you, you get to try it. Okay? So Myrna pass out the Ezekiel bread here. And how many of you have eaten Ezekiel cereal? Ezekiel 4-9 cereal. That stuff is the pits. And all I can say for you is that shows you how much he had to suffer when he was doing this illustration. The bread's not too bad, because you can doctor it up a little bit. But you just put all those grains together in a cereal. That's blah. I'll tell you, it, it, there's no taste whatsoever. So that, that's bad stuff. <laughs> uh, so, but we, we brought some uh, Ezekiel bread for you, just so that you'd kind of enter into this and be part of the... Um, be part of Ezekiel. I want you to, I want you to get right down there. I really ought to have you all get on the floor and lay on your left side. Here. <laughs> but uh, that probably is not the best thing. It's kind of hard to take notes on your left side on the floor, but if you were doing that, or you actually you reach up like this on your computer, I guess, and then change it. Okay, <laughs> whatever you're doing. Yeah, again, I want you to, it's a picture, okay? He's, he's doing a drama for them. And they're sitting here watching this. They can see very clearly. This is a description. This is a, a drawing of Jerusalem. This guy's laying siege to the city. This guy's going to do it for so long a period. The judgment's going to take so long. And he's going to, they're going to have very little to eat, very little to drink, you know, both within the siege. It's going to be, uh, that's the whole purpose. And even after the siege, uh, that will be true. By the way, you'll notice it says 390 years and doesn't mention the 40 the second time. And, of course, a lot of ink's been spilt on that one uh, about why he didn't include the 40 again. I, 
I personally think he probably ate it in 40 day, uh, the 40 days as well. But it's, it's not, it's just the point is that what the, the, the scarcity of food that you will have during the time of the siege that's taking place. Now, if you've read any commentaries at all, you'll recognize that the 390 days or the 390 years and the 40 years has uh, gotten all sorts of ink uh, on that. And uh, when all is said and done, nobody knows for sure. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry about that. There's just no definitive interpretation. I think what's very clear is it's 390 years, 40 years. 390 is, uh, is the, the weight that Israel must bear, and 40 is for Judah. It shows you that from this perspective, Israel had more iniquity to bear than did Judah. That's going to be interesting when we come to some other passages like chapter 16 and 23 where it talks about the relationship of uh, Judah and Samaria as sisters. And there will imply that Judah did even worse in the short amount of time, but they didn't do it as long uh, as Israel. But as I say, we don't know. I personally, the only thing that makes somewhat sense to me, as if you've read my commentary, and I'm not going to go to the stake on this, by the way, uh, I'm not dogmatic on it at all, but uh, the, if you add the three together in the four, 30 years and you start from the basic chronological point of the book, you know, if you take Jehoiada, where everything chronologically is being based in the book, off of the fifth year of the exile of Jehoiachin, you end up exactly at 167 B.C., which is when the, uh, when the, uh, Ma the Maccabean kingdom began. That's when the revolt began and was the only time that Israel once again became a nation from the time of the captivity. And it seems to me that that's a possibility that he's talking about, you know, that uh, you're bearing the sins from that point uh, till the time of the Maccabean uh, return of the nation as a, as a nation, as a people. It's not talking about the end return. It's not talking about those things at this point. But as far as the iniquity that they were bearing in light of what the captivity was bringing upon them and the iniquity that will continue. As I said, I'm not living and dying on that one. Uh, as, I said, you, as I said, when all is said and done, nobody knows for certain uh, because we don't have any specifics on that. We do know that the emphasis is that uh, they will bear the iniquity of their sins in discipline for an extended period of time of 430 years. Some want to put that before, uh, and some want to put it after, and so forth. And uh, you can read those different arguments. I, I don't think we should spend the time doing it. The, the Septuagint amended the text to try to deal with the problem, and it's quite obvious when you look at what they have done that, that what they're doing is trying to recognize they, they can't answer the question, so they're trying to solve the question by changing and amending the text, which at that point then tells you, better watch that translation, so to speak, uh, because somebody's trying to change something, and when you start doing that, it's obviously that it wasn't that way to start with. Okay? So they have the meager diet, they have the length of it, and they really, the, when it's said and done, what we have in chapter 4 is a picture of the conditions of the siege and the exile where they will eat foreign food in the ex in both in the siege and in the exile and that they will bear their iniquity for the amount of time that they, uh, for the, four and the 390 and the four uh, 40 days, the 430 altogether. Now, at the same time, you're still on your side and you're still on the, you know, each side. And we have, he says in chapter 5, Now, son of man, Take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor and shave your head and your beard. Now, first of all, this was something that uh, that was a, a, a priest was unholy if he did this. If you go back and read in, in the book of Leviticus. If a priest shaves his head and, and his beard, he is no longer holy to the Lord. So Ezekiel is... In a sense, God is having him be a picture lesson. He's a constant picture lesson himself to people of being defiled and humiliated himself as a picture of the humiliation of the Judeans. 
uh, they are the ones really humiliated, but he is a picture that that can be done. And he's willing. God often takes and has his servants do things that might be contrary to uh, his ways as picture lessons, not because God's condoning it. But he's using Ezekiel here as a picture to the people of the defilement that it occurs among the people. Even he being a priest and doing that which a priest would not normally do at that point. So he shaves his head. He shaves his beard. Uh, he gives them a picture of defilement uh, and the humiliation and de disgrace, which it was. Because after all, your beards and your hair for men is very important and you shave it all off. It's a disgrace. Um, got some friends that did, have done that. But I don't know what that means. Uh, so he does this now. Not only that, he takes the hair and he divides it into three parts. And you take your hair and you put your, over here, you're still lying on your side, by the way. And you're still laying seeds of the city. And you somehow have to shave your head and your beard. And then you cut it and you put it in three different groups, okay? So yeah, boy, how would you like to be watching all this? Say, this guy's weird, man. You know, what is he doing? And it's exactly, I think, what the, the, uh, the elders were doing. They were trying to figure this out. What is going on? And he's going, to, that's why the world message is. God says, okay, I want you to stand up and tell them, in, a, in essence. Because they're here trying to figure this out. It should, should be rather obvious, though, laying siege to the city. You know, as far as cutting the hair, that's a disgrace. They should understand that. As far as the three piles, no, that's probably not real clear to them. One-third of them, he tells us very clear, one-third of those hairs are going to be in the situation they're going to be burned. He says, you burn one-third of them, one-third of them, take your sword out and you chop it up. Okay, It's kind of hard to be bound up if you're going to chop it yourself, all the time. And then one-third of those you're going to take and you're going to scatter them to the wind. Okay, And by the way, you take a little bit out of that group and you stick it in the hem of your garment. Here, okay? Keep that one close. Now, uh, we will go on and then he gives... He gives us our interpretation. We don't have to dream it up. Just go to the text. Tells it very clear. One third of them will die in the siege and the fire of Jerusalem. Okay, that's that's what one third, and they'll uh, a part of those will also die during the siege from famine and distress. Of course, that's what siege. That's the whole purpose of a siege is to starve you out, so you surrender in the distress. One third of them will be killed by the sword. And he goes on later that most of these uh, will be killed outside the city, the ones that are killed by the sword, but some within. Because again, the people that are leaving are the ones that are attacked by the sword. If you end up in the city, you either die or you surrender uh, in a normal siege. And then one third, <coughs> pardon me, that, <coughs> that are scattered to the wind are those that will go into dispersion. They're going to be dispersed to the wind, to the, to the, among the nations. And even some of those, he says, will die by fire in the process. And some of those will die by the sword that are scattered among the nations. Uh, so, and from this group, there'll be this little small part that's put in the hem of the garment. That is the remnant. Okay? That will be protected. It's a small part. A small part of one-third. So there are some that are holy unto God and follow his ways. God always has his remnant, yes. Any idea of how many people that represented of people dying? I really don't. No. Uh, it must have been ugly. It must have been very ugly. Yeah. Yes, you were, and as we'll read further, I mean, it gets gruesome. Uh, siege warfare was, was horrible. People would, well, we'll have it here. We'll have it in Ezekiel. They'll eat each other. Cannibalism became a very common thing, uh, among, among other things. The plague, of course, you get all the disease that happens when, you, when you're in a siege. You, don't, you, you, know, you cannot get rid of the waste and so forth. And so you have disease and plagues. And that's why much of the judgment that's mentioned back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, so where it mentions disease, plagues, Sword, fire, essentially we're seeing them all. Everything is mentioned uh, that will come in the Mosaic Covenant is coming. That's why I say it's the Mosaic Covenant is so, you have to understand that to 
understand in many ways what's happening here. God's doing what he said way back there he would do if they did not follow his way. Mm -hmm. Is Ezekiel uh, spending more than a year on his side and then after mm -hmm. a year's time shaving off his beard and his hair? Is that a Nazarite vow? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No, that was not done in, in that same way. Nazareth you're supposed to let it grow. You know. So uh no, I wouldn't see that. Now uh he goes on in in the latter part, you know, the first five verses of five, of chapter five tell you I mean the first four verses tell you what he's doing. This is the as far as the the hair the shade. Then from five to seventeen uh, is the interpretation. He explains to you all that's what's involved and then summarizes toward the end that you will, uh, he says in verse 14, I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you in the sight of all who pass by. You will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and an object of horror to the nations around you when I inflict punishment upon you in anger and in wrath and with stinging rebuke. By the way, Leviticus and Deuteronomy say there'll be a reproach among the nations. That's, that's happening here as well. And I will shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine. I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you. Wild beasts are also mentioned in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you and I will bring the sword against you. I, Yahweh, have spoken. I spoke back there. I'm telling you again. I'm doing what I said. And if there's a message that continually comes to me, Ezekiel is, God is telling us, I mean what I say. I do what I say. And I wonder if we really believe that. You know, are often you and I, and we all hear the arguments and probably make them ourselves. But today, and then da 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 And then we have all the differences and the reasons why, well, that's not, you know, those things don't, God doesn't do that anymore. Well, I think we may have some surprises coming. Okay. God does what he says. And he's, when God speaks in the scripture about our life and how we're to live, he means what he says. Now, he hasn't announced, you know, Babylonian captivity on any country today in the world, as far as I know. But what he said then, what he said for Israel, he's done. What he says for us, he will do. And we can, uh, we can be sure of that. The word of God is God's word, and he means every bit of it. Yes? Yeah, I have a, I have a question in regards to what you're saying. In, uh, for example, New Orleans, uh, and following that pretty closely, I, it was said on, on TV that this is one of the most decadent cities around. And the time of the devastation there, they were actually celebrating. There was a convention that was going on. It was a convention of decadence. Now, I'm just, just wondering, uh, you know, if, if what God, uh, his part in, in that whole thing. To me, well, he certainly was not unaware. Uh, yeah, certainly was not unaware. And uh, I think that uh, we may be getting some glimpses. Uh, I have nothing against New Orleans uh, at all. But uh, you you are right. I mean, of all, just get it out of the religious realm. People will tell you that New Orleans wasn't a very good place to be. Um uh, and that very, very well may be the case. How about the tsunami? I don't know. I, you know, constantly, you know, of course, the scripture tells us we're going to continue to have earthquakes and, uh, and uh, rumors of war and so forth. I'm not necessarily convinced in some ways that we have more than they used to have. In fact, boy, if you go back Middle Ages and you go back to Roman and thing, boy, I tell you, they killed a lot of people when they fought hundreds of thousands. I think we know about more today because of media 
and may you know it may seem like it's more to us. Certainly, it isn't getting better. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Uh, and I think the uh, what we've seen in the past year, as far as all the natural disasters, they uh, they may be natural from our perspective, but they're supernatural from God's perspective. And uh, you know, can we explain them all? No, I can't. Uh, can I tell you why? No. I do know, however, that uh, God does carry out His discipline and justice uh, in situations of, for reasons we may not know, but the local people may know, or they, you know. And so I have to be quick. I think I have to be careful about going around and saying, you know, these are all the, you know, hellfire and brimstone about what God's making. But you got to, as I say, God knows and He's sovereign, and these uh, did not happen naturally. They happened under the hand of God. Uh, just like Jonah. I love the book of Jonah. You read that in the Hebrew text. Jonah was fleeing out there in the water and God hurled the storm right down. On the, you know, he just threw it right down there and got him. You know, didn't take much. Just like that. Uh, I, I just think, you know, that's one thing I like about the people in the Old Testament. They believed that what happened was the hand of God and whatever happened. We don't today. That's too bad, because it is. It's the hand of God. And we've, we've separated ourselves. And we think you know, somebody came up with some scientific thing, or they seeded the clouds, or they did something, you know. We, we have all sorts of explanations for these things. Uh, God is in control. Oh, I like that. I like it for all the reasons. I'd hate to know he's not in control. Boy, we, we're in trouble. Yes? I had a question in chapters 4 and 5. You're saying um, Ezekiel's conduct, like with the brick and lying on his side, cutting his hair, <coughs> the people you mentioned, they might have thought that to be pretty weird. Yeah. Is In your studies, have you come across any like ancient Near Eastern parallels where people would do like dramas like that to portray something? Or, or would they have just thinking that was totally weird? No, dramas are done. There's not a lot of a record of that, but there are some where dramas are done. And you have some others in the scripture, just Ezekiel has so many of them. I mean, this guy is, uh, he's doing, you know, he was almost like doing cartwheels through the book, you know, uh, and doing dramas. Uh, so it's not uncommon, but it's not s something that's real frequent that you'll see. You'll, you'll have prophets having visions, but it's usually put in this way. I saw a vision of the Lord, and then he'll give you a message. The prophet will, but you don't have the description of that. Uh, but here you have the description of what we would call and what are called literally symbolic acts. There are acts that are picture lessons uh, that a person should look at that and, and it should communicate. And I think it probably did. I think they didn't know what to say. And of course, Ezekiel wasn't talking until God opens his mouth. Uh, I can say, I don't know how you can look at a, a brick that's got Jerusalem on it, and the guy's got, you know, siege warfare all around it, and the siege wall, and so forth, without getting a picture, probably, he's talking about something about the siege of Jerusalem. <laughs> and then, uh, I, better, I better watch what he does. Oh, he's eating uh, this strange food, you know, this strange diet. Uh, I'm sure they were watching this closely. I think they were, they may have understood more than we think, because we don't have their response, by and large. Uh, but they were there, and he was demonstrating very clearly for them uh, these acts, which uh, I say should be pretty, pretty obvious and clear to them. Uh, but at, you know, as you conclude uh, five, there, you know, it, he says, I, "I'm going to do this, and I and I will bring the sword against you. I have spoken." Uh, this is, uh, he will bring his justice and judgment, and they will know that God has spoken when he's done. It's too bad they don't find out till then. You know, I mean, it's really sad. And you know, I don't think we have the compassion again upon the sinners like we ought to have. You know, Ezekiel is going to just weep and cry and, and beg with God, just like Moses did for Israel. You know, I mean, are there any? Are you going to destroy everybody? You know? And I don't think sometimes we have that compassion that we ought to have upon the, the, the sad condition of the people in this world. 
this world is messed up. Let me tell you, from anywhere you go, it's messed up. And these people are hurting. You know, people commit suicide all the time. People don't know what to do in life. And uh, we have a message, and our heart should bleed and cry for the people of the world that are lost, not say, oh, get them, God. You know, I think some people, uh, you know, I found some evangelicals that just want God to go out there and zap everybody. Well, that's God's business. And I can guarantee you, there he is just, but our hearts should be hearts full of mercy and compassion. And uh, we should cry and plead to God uh, that he would, in his grace, somehow that these people would hear and they would respond because I can't imagine what they're, you know, going through a siege of Jerusalem and, and all the horrors that we just read about. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I, how, you can't stand by that and say, oh, you know, whoopee in this. It's, it's sad. So when we come to chapters 6 and 7, we have, uh, we have the, the, dis the discussions, actually, in many ways, about this. He's dramatized in 4 and 5. <clears throat> and in 6 and 7, says down at the beginning of 7, The word of the Lord came to me. Now, not until the word comes, then he says, Son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says to the land of Israel. The end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. The end is now upon you, and I will unleash my anger against thee and judge you according to the conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look upon you with pity or spare you. I'll surely repay you for your conduct and detestable practices that then you will know that I am Yahweh. Because I'm going to do what I said I would do. It's the end. Boy, it's very emphasized. He makes it clear. That, hey, folks, it's over. This is the end. And so you have here uh, the description of the judgment predominantly, and he's going to he's telling him what he wants them to say. Guys, what you just saw me, it's, it's here, guys. It's right around the corner. The end's here. Okay? If you didn't get the picture, let me tell you. It's all over. God's going to do what he said. And you'll know that. If you don't believe it now, you will when he does it. And he's going to destroy all the high places, you go on to describe. He's going to destroy all the pagan altars, all the pagan incense altars, all the pagan practices. He's going to, the bones of the Israelites that worship around these pagan things, they will die. Their bones will be scattered around the pagan shrines, the pagan inst institutions. Uh, why? Because of the justice of God. And only then, perhaps, the rest of you will start recognizing that Yahweh is the one doing this. He is God. He is the only one. Uh, at, you know, we read in, uh, there in verse 8, But I will spare some. For some of you will escape the sword when you are scattered among the lands and nations. Then the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escaped will remember me. How I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts, which have turned away from me. And by their eyes, which have lusted after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evil they have done and for all their detestable practices. And they will know that I am Yahweh. I did not threaten in vain to bring this calamity on them. I didn't just say it, but I didn't mean it. No, I meant it. But you see, the purpose of his judgment has been effective on some. They got the point, and what did they do? They confessed their sin. They openly were ashamed of that. They were those who were grieved in their hearts for what they had done. They were grieved that they turned away from God and that they had lusted after the idols. So you see, that's the purpose of the judgment of God is corrective to change. Unfortunately, it's just some. But there is, in that case, a remnant. 
that would follow his way. They'd abhor their past and their wicked ways and be ashamed of them. So, as he begins the second part of this message in verse 11, the Lord says to him, this is what the Lord Sovereign says, Strike your hands together and stamp your feet. Alas, because all the wicked and detestable practices of the house of Israel, for they will fall by the sword, famine, and plague. You know, you get after a while, there's going to be swords, famines, plagues. You know, it, he keeps repeating them. But those are all of the things that are mentioned in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 29. As far as the actual judgments that will come when they walk away from him and they go out of the land, this is what will happen. And we're reading every one of them here. Exactly what God said way back there at the time of Moses. He is saying, okay. You have not walked in my way. You've turned away. And now I am doing exactly what I said there. I, what I have spoken, that I am doing. And the stomping, the clapping of the hands and the stomping of the feet is, uh, can, can be two things in the Old Testament. It can either be in rejoicing or it can be in utter indignation and, and anger. And I think the context, I think, should be pretty clear. I don't think God's out there clapping his hands that he's bringing the judgment. I think he's very happy of those that turn. But it's the indignation of God concerning the, the judgment of the people. And everyone's going to be touched by this. Uh, as, as, he, uh, talks, as he discusses this, every individual uh, will be... Uh, he says, touched by the, the sword, the famine, the plague. No, it's 12. He that is far away will die of the plague. He that is near will fall by the sword. He that survives and is spared will die of famine. So I'll spend my wrath upon them. It, it's comprehensive, folks. It, it's whether you're far, whether you're near, whether you try to get out and you're caught in the middle, God's uh, judgment comes upon them. Uh, and the bones of the worshipers will be scattered around their shrines. The entire land will be left desolate from north to south. As he goes on to say uh, in 12, uh, I mean, in the, you know, every part of it, every high hill, every mountaintop, every leafy thing, all that, I'll stretch out my hands against them and the land, and make the land desolate waste from the desert to Dibla, wherever they live. Actually, I... Uh, there's the question of the Dibla, probably is Ribla, which is a very known, well-known site. And you, and you say, well, that's a textual change. Yes, if you know the ancient, and I don't mean the box script, the box Aramaic script that we have now in Hebrew, but if the earlier script, the Rash and the Dalit are very close. And most likely, we have a we have a scribal copy error here where they put. And what look, they put the Dalit rather than the Raish. But in the context, it, uh, in, in light of what we know, because that's where Nebuchadnezzar was based in himself, we know later, at Riblah. And most likely that's it. So in other words, the whole thing will be desolate wherever they live. Doesn't make any difference where you are. This is comprehensive. This will touch everybody. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. This we can't get away from that phrase. Notice it keeps coming up over and over again after every statement of judgment. Then they will know. The purpose is that through the judgment, he's trying to get their attention. Guys, wake up. You know, turn. Follow my ways. Boy, we humans can be so bullheaded. I mean, well, we're already told they're hard-hearted hard and hard-headed. and I think a lot of us are too. <laughs> at times. You know, he's trying to get through to them. That's a manifestation of God's love and grace. Oh, it could be just, I'll oh, forget it. I've had it with you guys. Zop! Just wipe them all out. Glad you're gone. Just like that. Okay? But no, he wants them to know I'm doing what I said. Get it, guys. No, I am Yahweh. I do what I say. And again, men, God does what he says in the word. 
And when we read in the scripture about what he wants us to do in our lives, I think it's imperative that we do everything possible to do that. That's why he gave it to us. He, didn't, he wouldn't just say, well, let's see, I think I'll write something new here. Maybe how about this one? Try it on if you like it, okay. That's okay. No. He's writing what's for our own good. What's best for us. And how, in turn, we can glorify him and be a holy witness of him to the world. And that's why we're here. Go back and read Psalm 67. It's a psalmist out there saying, I, I understand the Abrahamic covenant and I understand I can't do it. So he calls on the grace of God and his blessing. By the way, the word Baruch mostly is in, in context of empowerment for success. When blessing happens, something is empowered to be successful. God, apart from your grace and your empowerment, uh, which comes predominantly, if you check through the scripture, empowerment of God comes and blessing through the word of God and the spirit of God. And through the empowerment of the word of God and the spirit of God, I then can fulfill that vocation to which God has called me. That's why I'm here. That's why we're all here. To be a blessing to the world. To bring God to the world and the world then comes to God. That's why we're here. We're priests. You may be here to be a pastor. You may be here to be a youth person. You may be here to be a businessman. I don't know, but I don't care what you are. That's your vocation. That's what the vocation of all the people in your church. And in our church situation in Moscow, I'm thrilled to death. You know who the real missionaries are? Our businessmen, our artists, our people that are out there in the workplace sharing the gospel with people. And I have the privilege to help walk alongside and equip them. But they're out there reaching people where they are. And that's what the church needs to be doing. I heard of a church in America. I don't know where it is. Now, maybe this is apocryphal. I don't know. But I like it. Okay? And when you drove out of the parking lot, there's a sign as you drive out of the parking lot. You're now entering the mission field. Amen. That's the way it should be all the time. That's the mission field. Go get them. You know, we come to gather together to be equipped, and developed, and trained. And please, please teach in your church. Please don't leave people ignorant of the Word of God. There's too many people. I taught at Wheaton College, and I saw student after student come in who thought because they'd been in evangelical churches, they knew the Scripture until they took their first test. And they found out they hadn't. They were biblically ignorant. What are we doing in our churches? We're not instructing people in the Word of God. And there it's, Paul tells us we're to be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. The ministry's out there. And when you enter the, leave the parking lot, you enter the mission field. You don't have to go across the pond. Right here, mission field. All of us. When we leave the seminary parking lot, mission field. Right out there for all of us. So, he said that uh, this will be the effect upon them and everyone will be touched by this, uh, these disease. And the purpose is to restore the hearts. Four times he mentions in this text. The purpose is to restore people's hearts. The here is to know God. To know he is God. To know Yahweh. Okay. In chapter 7, the emphasis is, as he continues, the word of the Lord came to me. And this is all within the same context. This is all falling. He's still on his side and he's giving messages and so forth. You know, it's real, got to be a real actor to do all this. You know, got your hair out here and, and you're giving these messages. Okay. The word of the Lord came to me because it's all dated under the same date. And it won't, that won't change until we get to chapter eight. Okay. So in seven, he says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the land of Israel. The end. Okay. It's the end. It's over here. Okay? And here the, eminent, the, the emphasis is upon the imminency and the comprehensiveness of the judgment that will come. It is now. It's the end. Six times the word end is stressed. And coming is mentioned seven times, which shows between the two the end here and it's coming. 
It's imminent. It's right here. Get ready. And the extent is the four corners of the land. All of the land is involved in this. Uh, it's a judgment, and the basis of that judgment is the wicked context, conduct pardon me, uh, of Israel, her abominations. That's repeated over and over again. Why does God bring judgment? Because you disobeyed the word of God. It's, this is not complicated. It's so simple, but we miss it. And I find it's so easy for us today. It's so easy for our people, especially in this country, where things are so fuzzy. And everybody puts the spin on everything in Christian circles as well as outside of Christian circles. And it, one needs great wisdom and discernment to live in this country. You know, where I live, I tell you, most of the Russians will tell me up right, we're, we all ought to be in jail. I've had guys tell me that. I asked one of the guys, I said to one guy, I won't tell you all the context, but we, we, we ended up having everybody in jail, including the government. So I said to him, well, maybe just shut, you know, put everybody in jail and just close the country down. Well, he didn't particularly like that. But I mean, that's basically where you know, because there's such a negative perspective. And they all think they're right. So you don't have to convince a lot of the Russians they're sinners. What you do around here? And uh, we, we uh, it, it's too fuzzy. And we, uh, people need to understand that, that God means business. It's important to obey the word of God. I cannot drive that home. If anything you get from Ezekiel, I hope you get that. God means business. He's not playing games. We must do what he says. Not because he's sitting there with a whip, but because he won't. it's for our good and for his glory. Why wouldn't we want to do it? That's the better question. And he says in, in his prophecy that he goes on to say, and I will pity no one here. You know, he says the end is come, the end is come, is roused against you, it's come. Verse 5 and 6. Doom has come upon you, dwell upon the land. It's come upon you, it's near. I'm going to pour out my wrath on you and spend it against you. you know? uh, this is pretty clear as far as what's happening in the situation. And I will, I will look uh, upon your conduct and I will repay you, he says, according to what you've done. These are detestable things. And no one's going to get out of this. You know, it's, it's for all. It's an imminent thing, uh, the disaster that has come upon them. And uh, the basis, again, is their conduct. Uh, goes on continually, uh, ten and following. Still, it is here, it's come. Doom is birthed forth, the rod is budded, the arrogance is blossomed. Violence has grown into a rod of punishment and wickedness, and none of the people will be left, none of that crowd. No wealth, nothing of value. Forget your money, guys. It isn't going to help you. Nothing helps. It's coming. I mean, you read this chapter, and one thing you get through, you, it's, hey, guys, it's here. And it's going to touch every person. And uh, nothing's, going to, to, uh, nothing's going to help you in this. The time has come. The day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller grieve, for wrath has come upon the whole crowd. Probably most in reference perhaps to the sabbatical year context where you know you sell it, but then you're going to, you know, it's be able to get back in the seven years. Hey, neither one of you guys is going to be around when the seventh year comes. So neither one of you are going to regain anything. Yeah, forget about that. That's not even an option for you. Uh, it's, there's a permanency of this and it's happening quickly. The rod here, there's been a lot of discussion. Of course, the rod is often used uh, for uh, judgment. Uh, and I think contextually, probably the rod that he's speaking of is going to be Nebuchadnezzar because he's the instrument of judgment within the whole context of the book. Uh, verse 15, outside is the sword, inside are plagues and famine. Those in the country will die by the swords. Those in the city will be devoured by the famine and the plague. All who survive and escape will be in the mountains and mourning like doves in the valleys because of his sin. Every hand will go limp and every knee will become weak as water. Uh, if you're scared to death, I don't know if you've ever, you ever been scared, you know, really frightened. 
you know, you feel like, you know, it all goes limp at that point. And that's their description. Uh, they will put on sackcloth and be clothed with terror. Their faces will be covered with shame. Their heads will be shaved. They will throw their silver into the streets and their gold will be an unclean thing. It doesn't help them. The silver and the gold will, be able to, will, will not be able to save them in the day of God's wrath. They will not satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it for it has made them stumble into sin. Yeah, that's a good one for U.S. Most people are eating out and filling their stomachs and, and so forth and they didn't going to help them here all these things they were proud of their beautiful jewelry and used to, to make detestable idols and vile images they took of the treasuries of the temple we know when we read the book of kings and chronicles and especially kings and made idols out of it you know so they're turning that into detestable I will turn these into unclean thing for them I will hand it all over to the plunder of foreigners and as loot to the wicked of the earth and they will defile it. I will turn my face away from them and they will desecrate my treasured place. Robbers will enter it and desecrate it. God is willing to allow his temple to be desecrated in order that somehow Judah might understand that he is God and turn to him. He allows even in the dispersion his name to become a reproach. Because in those days when a, when a nation uh, went down in defeat, people associated the God of that nation with it and they figured that showed the weakness of that God. And you can read in Ezekiel and especially in the other prophets as well that God was willing to let his name be profaned among the nations. For the sake of his people Israel. Because when he judged them. And destroyed Jerusalem. And sent them into dispersion. The rest of the world said. Well what kind of a guy is that? He's not very strong to protect his people. And basically if God were speaking at that point. He'd say guys I don't care. What you think. I'm doing this for my people. But one day. My name will be restored. When I restore them. And they're cleansed. God's willing to humiliate himself for us. Of course, the greatest example of that is in his son who became a man and died on a cross. And they, all the humiliation of that so that we could live. Uh, we have that visualized even here for us in a little bit at the beginning. But the last, notice they're, they're here. You can see them just grasping. What do I do? You know, uh, I, I, my money won't help me. Uh, nothing's helping me at this point. What do I do? Verse 23, prepare the chains because the land is full of bloodshed. The city is full of violence. I will bring the most wicked of the nations to take possession of their houses. I will put an end to the pride of the mighty and their sanctuaries plural note, will be desecrated. What do you mean plural? Well, they're out there building them. You know, we've excavated some of them. You know, they're out there. And, uh, you know, he's going to, they're going to be taken over by foreigners. And of course, you know, uh, Habakkuk, uh, he argues that point with God. How can you do that? You know, they're more wicked than we are. Well, this is not a relative thing of wickedness at that point. Uh, it's God's judgment. When terror comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Calamity on calamity will come and rumor upon rumor. They will try to get a vision from a prophet. The teaching of the law by the priest will be lost, as will be the counsel of the elders. Everywhere they would turn, no answer. Whether it be the elders, the leaders of the country, the priest, the prophet, nobody to help. No answers. They've already been told the answer. The king will mourn and the prince will be clothed with despair. And the hands of the people of the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their conduct. And by their own standards, I will judge them. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. 
So he's announced the fall of Jerusalem. Both he's done it by picture lesson. He's done it by oral message. You would think they would have gotten the point. Tune in tomorrow. Find out whether they did or not. Okay? <laughs>